Okay, you're going to start off with another another story about Tiomkin. Oh yes, yes, yes. This was uh, we I, I forget what picture it was in, but anyhow, uh, all the pictures were the same. He was recording. You got to say who was recording. Yeah, uh, the, the, Demetrius Yomkin was recording. He always recorded with the orchestra, and he was one of the few men, I don't know any other man in, in Hollywood who could demand as big orchestra as he had. He, 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 they, they would push, you know, cut men off for money and everything else. But he, they let him have what he wanted. He always had a whole symphony orchestra when he recorded. So he's recording this day, and uh, he plays, and his music is so big, you know, it plays such big chords and so forth. So we went to lunch, and we came back after lunch, and was just sitting around there ready to start the, again. And he said to the, uh, this, he had two, two grand pianos. Boy, you can't have that in an orchestra. The one is enough, but he had two grand pianos and an organ. He all oh, such orchestras he had. So he said to this pianist, and the pianist's name, I can't think of his name, but he's the man that wrote the Lord's Prayer. What's his name? Oh, I, I can find out. You know, who, who wrote the Lord's, who wrote the Lord's, Our Father, that, that arrangement of the Lord's Prayer. Well, this is the man, and he was a very fine pianist, and he played all the time with Demetrius Orchestra. So we're fixing to start to work after lunch. You know, orchestra's all getting ready and all set down there. And so Demetrius said uh, to what, two pianos, two grand pianos. Nobody has that but me, Demetri, you know. And he said to this pianist, uh, look at uh, page so and so and so and so, the 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 number we had just recorded before lunch. You know, he said. Uh, did you have your foot on pedal so-and-so-and-so, number so-and-so-and-so, uh, 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 bar number so-and-so-and-so-and-so. So the fellow looks through and looks through the bar and he looks and says, damn fine, didn't he? He says, too loud. Too loud. <laughs> Boy, they raised the whole, the whole show. I said, as loud as Demetrius things was all rushing, you know. About 80 pieces in there, more than any other orchestrator. He could get more men and things. And had this, and he said, too loud. Too loud. <laughs> How you could hear the, the piano on. It was something, I'm telling you, that, that went all over Hollywood. I heard Demetrius too loud. <laughs> oh, he was something. I'm so glad I worked with him. And another time, I, I must tell this one, because this is really, really wonderful, Demetrius Tompkin. He told me, he says, Jester, <coughs> what, uh, what do you eat? at your house. I said, we eat anything we can get. <laughs> I still grew up on fi find anything to eat. And he says, I would like to come to your house for dinner one day. And I said, you're welcome, Mr. Tiumpkin. Come anytime you feel like you like to come to my house. So I told my wife, and she said, you might eat the great Demetrius Tiumpkin. Way over where we lived, over in the black district, you know. He's coming here. I said, he said he wants to come. I, I don't have any prejudice like, <laughs> like so many people. If he wants to come to my house, he eats what I eat. And she says, oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. So this day, he decided he wanted to come. His wife had gone somewhere, and he decided he wanted to come to my house and spend a couple of hours, you know. And I said, Demetri says he'd like to come over tomorrow for dinner. And she liked to have a diet. She, she almost died. She said, oh, Lord, what will I serve you? And I said, well, I told him. He asked me what, it, what kind of meat did I have, and I said, fried rabbit. And she said, right, you're going to give Demetri fried rabbit. I said, I eat it, don't I? <laughs> I give what I eat. And and uh, some iced tea and uh, some some cornbread. And this, she said, you're going to give Mr. Tiamkin from Russia cornbread? I said, I, I, if he hadn't eaten it, he'll know how to eat it when I get through at my house. <laughs> I'm not just going to have dinner for Mr. Tiamkin. I'm just going to have what we eat. I'm not going to be... Uh, uh, going to a lot of expense, you eat the same rabbit that we eat. We eat it every day, don't we? <laughs> okay. So 
We came to the, he came to the house, but she was so nervous. She was so nervous she didn't know what to do. But she's a, she was a heck of a cook. And she cooked that rabbit, and he not only ate the rabbit, after dinner he unbuckled his belt, and we had a couch there, something like that, a little, a little bigger, I believe. And he lay down on that couch and went to sleep and slept about three hours. <laughs> I said, you see that? I said, this is my house. I'm not trying to make it for somebody else. I'm trying to be the better. This is Dmitri Tiongi. He has to come to my house. I didn't invite him here. He said he wanted to come. And so he told me, he said, that's the best dinner I've eaten. What is with that? I said, fried rabbit. He said, I tell my wife, she must have some fried rabbit. <laughs> that's all we had money to buy. <laughs> oh, no, I don't put it off. I ate what we could afford to get, that's all. That's a good story. Chester, let's cover a little bit about how you got involved with Amos and Andy. <laughs> I uh, I first had to, to uh, beat out my competition when I first started in with them. But, uh, uh, Ernestine Wade, the, the lady who played the part of uh, the Kingfisher's wife. Uh, George? Yeah, I guess that was the Kingfisher. Yeah, the Kingfisher's wife. Uh, 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 Ernestine Wade was her name. She played for years and years. And uh, she and my wife were good buddies. And she told me that uh, they were fixing to have a, uh, an audition for a new character on the show. Uh, what, was the, what was the character I played? Uh, Leroy? Leroy, yeah, yeah. And so she said, Jesse, you want to go out for this part? I said, yeah, I'll go out for it. I'll go out for any part. And uh, so she she recommended me. This uh, she was she and my wife were very good buddies. Her name, Ernestine Wade was her name, and uh, she worked on the side when she wasn't in movies or on television or something. She worked uh, as a um, stenographer for a lawyer there in town. But she was a very fine girl, Ernestine Wade, and a heck of an actress. So. Uh, the day he had his audition, he had about five of us apiece on his different characters, you know, things like that. And evidently, they chose me for uh, Leroy, the Kingfisher's brother-in-law. And then uh, after after that, some some time after that, they won another picture. Another I carried. I did another picture, another character. Who was that? I did Leroy, the Kingfisher's brother-in-law, and then I did uh, Henry Van Porter. That's right. He was one of the, uh, the, the Kingfish uh, said he wanted somebody in high society, in uh, black high society, who wore d nothing but a derby hat or something like that all the time. <laughs> so I, I, I went out for that and got that, and I played those two characters for about 10 or 12 years. With when, when, did your, when did you first start with Amos and Andy? I don't know what year it was, but it was way back. Altogether, I played about 15 years, 14, 15 years uh, altogether. Some of the you, you don't get in each and every part. Sometimes maybe it's cut two or three weeks before I get another part. I mean, my part, one of the two parts. I played uh, Henry Van Porter, and I played... Uh, uh, what was that? No good. Oh, Sapphire's brother, Leroy. Leroy, Sapphire's brother, and Henry Van Porter. And then some other crazy picture, a crazy part I played. Played three. So, about one of the parts I guess, you know, every two or three weeks or something like that. I, for years and years, all, all the years I got. And they were different characters. Now, Leroy, Leroy, the, the, the Kingfisher's brother in law, I played. That's her brother. Uh, uh, Sapphire's brother, I played, and that was the first one. And he was no good. I mean, he 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 never worked. He'd just go away and stay in the hobo and come back and eat up the kingfisher's food, you know, wear one of his belts or anything the kingfish couldn't find. He'd lay on on uh, Leroy. Well, I I played that character, lazy lazy character, and then Henry Van Porter was 
a, a member of the Kingfisher's uh, social group, only he was very prissy, you know. Really, well, now, uh, now uh, uh, Henry, uh, what, what is the key? Now, now, Kingfish, I do not. I do not uh, agree with everything you're having. He talked very proper, precise, you know, and altogether different character. And Leroy was the Kingfish brother-in-law. He was Sapphire's brother, and the Kingfish wanted him to go and stay away as long as possible. <laughs> Every time he'd come, the Kingfish would say, Hello, Leroy, when you leaving? <laughs> that was amazing. When you leaving? Leroy said, ah, I'm going to be around four or five days this time. He said, oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, you're welcome. <laughs> and Sapphire would come in on him. Now, Joyce, you know you don't mean that. <laughs> it, it, they, they, they wrote a lot of good stuff, wrote a lot of good stuff. But I stayed with them a long time, about 15, 16 years. How does that work between the radio Oh, well, we we, uh, uh, we we were on radio for years. I was with radio for about 12 years. But uh, then then radio went into, when radio went in, long before TV came into, into to being, why well, it was all radio. Just, uh, and that, that did Henry Van Porter and, and Leroy. But you could, you could, and when we did, uh, when, when ra radio come in, uh, TV came in, you just do one of the characters each each week or something. Then I change characters and uh, change clothes. But I had I changed my voices for both of them. Uh, the uh, Henry Van Porter was the good the good guy in the Kingfisher Society, high society. He didn't want uh, he didn't want the things that Kingfish uh, would suggest at all. He was against the kingfish because the kingfish was beneath him, you know, and he talked very proper. Now, kingfish, I am definitely against you and your, your family and all the things you stand for. He's just proper all the time. And the kingfish didn't like him because he was too smart, you know, always proper. But, but he, I stayed in him a long time. And uh, Ernestine Wade. The one who played the Kingfisher's wife got me on that, and she got my wife on there too. She she played several parts, very very well. I, we well, we're covering a lot of a lot of territory here. While we're on the television, let's talk about your involvement in a man in in the action. Oh oh, I got that. Uh, I, I had, these all, uh, plays like uh, Amen and so forth, was all competitive, you know. You had to go down and, and uh, read against everybody and his brother. I don't know how many men didn't read that uh, uh, ma uh, main character there. And finally they chose me for, uh, for the regular on it character. But, uh, oh, a lot, of, a lot of fellas came down to read. And that make you a little nervous too, because some of them were so good. You, you never thought you'd get it, but you just went down and hoped. But because in those days, there were a lot of fellas out of work. In fact, blacks the only work that we got in in groups, or or other than one or two, is the uh, uh, Tarzan pictures. Yeah, they were they were a lot of uh, naked blacks out there, you know, to, to do pictures like that for for, for Tarzan. What have I got? I've, I used to have a lot of th uh, things for Tarzan that I did. Uh, I was the witch doctor mostly in Tarzan pictures. I, I had the uh, witch doctor thing. Uh, I think I told you about uh, two lions, or three lions we were. It wasn't on tape, so tell us that story about your witch doctor and Johnny Weissmuller. Yeah, Johnny Weissmuller, yeah, John, Johnny Weissmuller. Uh, what was the name of that picture? I can't. Well, it was the same thing. Uh, somebody, what did they call it? But it was about his son and and his family, uh, Johnny Weissmuller's family. And uh, this time, if I'm talking right, brother, in so many of those pictures, they they captured. Uh, 
Ted, Tarzan and myself, Johnny Weissmuller and myself, and had me down. Did I tell you that they had us down on, on yes. Well, they, they caught us, the way they caught us, <coughs> we were up, up on the, something, up on the land, and there was a pit. They had caught three lions, and uh, the lions were supposed to eat up these natives that they caught. And so they caught these lions and put them down in a vault somewhere down a pit. And we were standing right on the edge edge of this pit. And uh, uh, they, they, uh, Tarzan wanted, he and I got in a fight. I gave you that, didn't I? Uh, oh, I didn't tell you about the fight we got into. Oh, yeah, we captured, we, we captured Tarzan. And uh, I was a witch doctor. And I had on my witch doctor costume, you know, and so forth. And I was urging them, these good big fellows, great big, big Africans, you know, had Tarzan. And I was telling them, throw him right down there. The, the three lions were down in the pit. And I was pointing down in the pit there. Throw him down there. And for some reason or other, Tarzan and I got got to fighting up there. And I don't know how, how the fellows let him go or something, but he and I got to fight and both of us fell, kaplunk, down there amongst the three lions, one there, there, and there. And we were right here. And then they changed scenes. It was we were supposed to be here falling down here. Then the next day, we're here already here falling. And we start the scene just like this. And, and uh, you three lions over there. And we were down on our face. Tarzan and I, so and we were the only two in the in the uh, cage. You see, the uh, this big man that oh he was a tough guy. Ooh, they 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 had some of the worst people you ever saw to uh, be uh, to take these lions and for, and tigers, all animals, from one cage to another. You know, they they were real tough guy, real, real tough. Uh, Circus men, get over there, you son of a so and so and so, so talking to the lions, you know. And we said, Gee, Lord, these, these lions understand English, you're going to get mad and beat these guys to death. <laughs> so, anyway, they, they had the three lions all there, and Tarzan and I are supposed to lie flat down on our stomachs, right in front of the lions. lions Good big toes standing out there. Boy, that's a scary thing. And every time you look up there, one of look, um, <laughs> look at you, God. Oh, brother, that is something. You and a lion that you don't know. I didn't know his mother, father, nobody in his family. He's looking down at me. So uh, <coughs> we were there, real, real. I don't know whether I told you this one or not. We got a lot of uh, times. Then says to me. Uh, Oh, yes, we were just lying there looking straight down, and the, the director's outside the cage. Everybody, the whole cast is standing there looking at us outside, but no, they're not, nothing can happen to them. But the director says, Jester, you, you and, and uh, what's your name? Uh, the, 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 you, you and Weissmuller look right down the floor. Don't look, don't raise your head to look up, you know. <laughs> and so we were looking down. And every time you raise your head up, look in these lines, looking right down at you, you know, and I take that. And so, and wife's mother said to me, said, what you thinking about, Jester? I said, well, if you want the truth, I'm just praying that if they decide to eat one of us, that their preference today is white meat. He said, well, but I think just the opposite. I said, I hope they like white meat instead of dark meat today. And he says, that's just what I was thinking, the opposite, just the, we, we may as well think that and pray for it. I, said, well, I hope, and he says, I hope they like dark meat. We just did that in these three lions. Oh, we stayed in there all day. I think two days we spent in there looking at these daggone lions. And every time we looked up, seemed like one of them look, looking right down at mm -hmm. Are you his name? I said, no, not my name. His name. <laughs> that's, as, that's as close as I've ever been. And when you're like this on your stomach and look over there at that foot, it gets weaker, you know, gets bigger out there. He has no, no, there's no end to a lion's foot. It's already big. <laughs> That is something. I've gone through so much of that stuff. Oh, gee whiz. Just terrible. But I, I, I like it. 
And you got the one in there about uh, uh, the dark meat in there. I gave you that one, didn't I? Yep, yep, you got that one. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Well, me, you made a comment about, I'd like a general comment about, I've run, it was, a, it, was a, it was a quote from a newspaper saying, I've run naked in more Tarzan films shot in Boana. Could you give just some... One of this and one of that. <laughs> yeah. Could you state that over again? Yeah, yeah, because uh, uh, the the name that the uh, natives, African natives, gave to Tarzan or any white man was Buana, just like in on, on my plantation where I was born. Or the names that they gave to the Hairstons was Massa, Ma Massa Peter, Massa John, Massa Jacob Hairston. Austin, there was Austin was the last name, so forth. So just the same as uh, they call him Master So and So, uh, they, they did they, they did in Africa call call their their masters Massa So and So. That's the same way we got it over here, and uh, but <coughs> but uh, yeah, we call him Massa. What about your involvement in Tarzan films? What have you done in some Tarzan films? Oh, oh, gee whiz, I was in Tarzan for a long time. Uh, I was a witch doctor, and so that made me get more work than that because the witch doctor was always around, you know, giving somebody a pill or something. Uh, well, one time, <laughs> uh, we, where that pay was at MGM, yeah, because they had two, two places, MGM and then later on, when we got almost over with Tarzan Pictures, they moved somewhere, which was out near there. It was another little studio. But we were, I was in so many Tarzan Pictures. This picture was a, a Tarzan picture where they uh, used elephants. No, no lions in this picture at all, uh, all, all elephants. And uh, they, they, we had to go into so many, you, you had to be able to swim and the director asks you when you come in to sign your name for it, to take a part for the picture. Says, can you swim? Oh, yeah, sure. So, well, okay, you're going in the water, this picture. So and so. A lot of guys couldn't swim a lick, but they were out of work. <laughs> lying with the, oh, oh, gee, we're lying like the devil. Everybody could swim. And the, the, the directors knew that thing, but they needed the help of all these fellas. So they just let them come and say, but we'll tell you, we tell you, you're going to have to go in the water, uh, and uh, whether you can swim or not. And uh, I was a good swimmer, so it was all right, but a lot of those guys couldn't swim. My buddy, Hamilton McLean, just got a letter from him yesterday. He'd been sick for years in a hospital in Chicago now. I've been writing to him for two or three years in that hospital. And he couldn't swim. Uh, but he was in a lot of Tarzan pictures. He just say yes, and just get lucky enough to be in a sh in a uh, uh, ro rowboat with somebody who could swim or something like that. Just plain luck. But we were all out of work. As soon as we heard that they were going to make a Tarzan picture, that's just like Santa Claus Day, you see, coming up. So all everybody could swim, and that's the first thing the director asked every black that signed up for the to be in the picture. Is the next word is can you swim? Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, everybody could swim. <laughs> Only half of them could swim. <laughs> My buddy couldn't swim. He come from uh, Barbados, Hamilton McLean. This boy sick now in Chicago. So uh, when they got in, they and we got in little boats. One big picture I remember. We were coming up in over in uh, where's where's the studio? Over here where they used to have, they had two studios over there now. They, they don't have many studios over there now. I'll, I'll tell where they were. But anyway, we, we signed up for this picture, and we got in this same man uh, that, that's in the hospital now. He and I were buddies, and they put us in one little boat, a little rowboat. And in those days, the Africans stood up in the boat. And that is a heck of a thing to do, to stand up in those small boats and, and, and row. <laughs> he, he rose, one fellow, and the front man rose this side, and then the, the back man rose, this, rose that way, or with his oar, you know. And the, you had to learn how to do it. It was hard to learn. 
but we learn how to do it so they know, are you a back man or a front man? If you're a front man, they push you on the left, you see, and so forth. And uh, well, we're in here, and uh, we're rowing up this place here. Where, what happened here now? Oh, yes. <laughs> we did this picture for about 14 days. Every day we'd go ahead, and all day we were just rowing from way down here, and we could go up there about a half a mile, up this big long river, just rowing, standing up, with nothing but little G things they call it, G shrink on it. That's all I had. And we're rowing up the boat, up the river. So this day, the director says, well, every day he would tell you, he says, now you better be, tell me when you swim that you, you uh, boys better tell me whether you can or not, but you're going on, and this is not the river, this is the ocean. And uh, everybody could swim. Nobody had money, so everybody, oh, man, yeah, we can swim. So we did it about two weeks, 14 days of nothing and singing all day. We had Tarzan's wife and his little boy. That little boy, I, I lived to see him get grown young and, and get put in jail. I don't know where he is now, whether he's still living or not, but I, I knew I lived that long. So here, they're, they're, they're in, in one of the, we've captured them, and they're in one of the boats going up the river. We go up this river here now. <coughs> so the man kept asking us every day, can you swim? Everybody could swim. So this morning when we come in, he said, boys, this is it. This is where you all go into the water. <laughs> they said, oh, my Lord. <laughs> then they start praying. Everybody was praying. <laughs> then nobody start praying till the day that we're supposed to go into the water. And then Jesus had to come to your rescue. So we got down at the bottom, got uh, Mrs. Uh, Tarzan. And Tarzan is up there in a tree somewhere over there. And the Mrs. and the little boy, his little boy, I, I lived to see that boy get grown, and yeah, I think he got arrested uh, sometime. I don't know what after that, but I think it was the year in, in school or something. He got arrested. But, but anyway, this he was in there eight or nine years old. And so here they come up. These fellas all come up rowing in this boat and singing. We, we captured Tarzan and his wife. We're taking her, them up the river to us. And we didn't see anything. I saw these elephants, oh, a uh, week, over a week before we uh, shot this last scene and thing, but we didn't pay attention to them. We thought there was a circus in town. And doggone this morning, when, <laughs> when we, the last day, we passed by, and here were all about 10 of these elephants right at our place. <laughs> and so when, when we started up the river, roaring and singing wild, Blacks, you know, with the uh, with Tarzan and his wife, uh, with Tarzan's wife and, and the little boy, nine years old, something. We're up there. So here we go. When we make this turn, they had nine elephants up this way. And these elephants come, they open the place. And then these elephants swim down the river, and we're going up the river. And she says, You're going to, the, the director says, Now, fellas, you, you're going to come head to head with these elephants as we come in line. We say, What? <laughs> <laughs> These ten elephants you go to come to head with. I said, Oh have mercy, Lord. My my buddy Hamilton McClay says, Can you swim Jess? I see. Yeah, I can, but I don't know whether I can swim away from t <laughs> eight elephants or nine elephants or not. But I'll try. Said, can you swim? No, he said, you can't I said, No, I can't help you at all today. <laughs> It's every tub. So he's from, and he was born in Barbados too, right in the middle of the ocean. <coughs> so we came up, up this place, and we got to this bend where we're supposed to turn. And then here come these elephants, all down, and and one elephant. Named, what was her name? Mary, I believe it was. But anyway, Mary was the lead elephant, and the other elephants had were, the one behind her have her trunk in her tail and holding on to the tail, and all till all the eleven elephants come down the middle of the of this river, and here we are going up here to meet them at this turn, you see. And when we met them at this turn, 
Brother Hell broke loose and he black started hollering mom and murder <laughs> help and everything and falling out of this boat. And all. It was really something. It was something real terrible. And the elephants got excited, you see. <laughs> and I looked around and there's some white, <laughs> the, 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 the people we used to, the, the white folks knew that some of these babies couldn't swim. And they had about eight or ten uh, lifeguards swim, white fellas, young, you know, and they were out there with black wigs on. <laughs> and these damn things came off, and they floating all around, and the white boys <laughs> were blondes under that. Oh, you should have seen that was. You ought to have seen that thing with these boys <laughs> dressed up like black thing, <laughs> and, and coming out here, these white hair, and women trying to help the blacks, trying to save the blacks. It was Confucius, brother. It was just terrible. And my, my man was yelling for me, and I left him. I left him. <laughs> it went over, swear. I could swim, thank God for that, and went over and saved myself over the side of the, the pool. But it was a long time. Nobody got hurt or killed in it, but it was real confusing. For a half hour there, boy, it was nip and tuck. And you could see these black wigs floating around on the top where the boys, white boys had lost them in here. They were blonde. All, rich, all poor. You're talking about messy. Oh, that's about as messy a scene as I've ever been in. Good gracious. Yes, sir, I was really, that was wonderful. I would really like to capture a general statement. This is, I'll, I'll read what was quoted in this article, and if you could repeat it, or something like that, that's general about your Tarzan involvement. This is quoting you. It says, I've run naked through more Tarzan films than I care to remember, wearing a ring in my nose and yelling Boana. Yeah, oh, sure. Could you, could you say something like that for us? Uh, well, I said that like that, like that, that Boana, uh, uh, you mean to, to make a situation out of it? I just want you to kind of repeat something like that. Yeah, that yeah, oh, comment. yeah, it says, uh, say, say in Buana, uh, well, I thought I had said a good bit of it in the restaurant, trying to uh, uh, get what these blacks who couldn't swim were yelling, Buana, Buana, his voice, Buana this and Buana that. <laughs> My father, Buana, help me. And they, all of them were talking about Buana, Buana this and Buana that. Please help me swim, but uh, I've seen more. Could, could you repeat something like this? That uh, get almost to these same words. I've run naked through more Tarzan films. Oh yes, I've run uh, uh, na naked in, in the oh yeah through more Tarzan uh, pictures than anybody's ever seen. Yelling wanna this and wanna that and <laughs> wanna please save me and everything. Yelling, trying to get uh, Mr. Charlie, the white man, to help me out of there. It, it wasn't anything but blacks to help. Half of us couldn't swim. Yeah. Uh, do you remember any stories about uh, other stories about Johnny Weissmuller or? Uh... Johnny was a very nice guy. He and I got along fine. I got along fine with Johnny. He didn't do too much talking. He stayed by himself mostly. In fact, the only times I ever saw Johnny were when he was called from his dressing room to come on the scene. He 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 didn't uh, do too much uh, uh, loafing around and talking. Uh, you, you know who did more than that was Bing, Bing Crosby. Bing was very sociable, and he was always had somebody in a quartet or or, or talk and tell some story that day. Johnny, uh, his buddy, who, who was with Bing Crosby? Bob. Bob Bob Hope. Never, never, never did. They were just the opposite from each other, like that. But but uh, Bing was always, because he was very sociable. And Bob, Bob didn't hate, or people didn't hate him, he just didn't bother as much as Bing. But Bing always had two, three fellas. And he liked quartets. He, he, any four men to him was a quartet. And he, he wanted to buzz. Okay, let's buzz one. <laughs> he always called it buzz. And he'd, he'd get to sing quartets with you. But uh, not Bob. But they worked in a lot of pictures together. Did you work any pictures with Bob Hope and Bing Crosby? 
Oh, yes, I worked in a good many of them at MGM uh, as, as an extra. I forget the names of them. But uh, we, especially with Bing Crosby, but Bing and Bob, because they, they used to do a string of pictures together. I don't remember the names of them now, but I, I was in, uh, an extra in back practically all the pictures that they did back in those days. Bing and Bob, and uh, another white comedian, what was his name? He was a very fast comedian. Well, I can't think of his name right now, but he that was in a lot of pictures that he was in. Um, you told about an incident about auditioning for directors, like at MGM, for a butler part. Do you remember that story? He asked you about your education. What did I tell him? You're, you're auditioning for a butler part at MGM, and he asked you about your education. And, and you said, you know, imagine that in order to get a, to, to have a, uh, let's see, what was it? Oh, yeah, to do a, to do a, a, an extra part, and you had to have all those degrees. Yeah, to, to carry a tray of glasses, you got to be Phi Beta Kappa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I had been, I had had a lot. I had had two years at the University of Massachusetts and two years at Tufts University, and, uh, Where else did I go there? One year at Pitts University of Pittsburgh. I had so much education <laughs> and still was nothing but a doggone extra in these pictures that uh, I didn't bother at all. I didn't bother about it. Let it be long. Do you remember that story about the director? You were trying out for a butler part. Can you tell that story? I can't remember. And, and, and he... He wanted me to tell him what, what, what my back education was. That's all right. It's, it was just a nice comment that, yeah. that you felt that here you had to have a, be a Phi Beta Kappa to carry a tray of glasses. <laughs> and that, but radio, you said, was the opposite. Radio, all they wanted to have you say was drop your Boston accent and say yes, sir. Yes, sir. Wanted this and wanted that. Long, <laughs> long as you said that, that you were all right. You say yes, sir. No, sir. Uh, oh, <laughs> here's one that came to me. Oh, what picture was the name of that? And the star I know was jo John Barrymore. Did you ever hear of John Barrymore? Uh, well, John Barrymore was the star of this picture, and it was at uh, Warner Brothers Studio. And uh, they had me there. To, to just be a, like a little running maid or something for for uh, for John Barrymore to just watch him because he was in his last days so he, he was older then than I am now uh, John was during this part and uh, they, <laughs> they they wrote down some of his uh, lines you know and would. Uh, had me write, uh, giving him some lines and someone else helping him with the lines and so forth. So uh, one fellow said to him, that one of the directors said to him, Mr. Uh, uh, Barrymore, you don't have to say, he was missing the line, and uh, the fellow said, uh, you don't have to say this, or we, we just cut this out, so and so and so. So I went to him, and he says, uh, did you hear that? And I said, no, sir, what was it, Mr. Barrymore? And he says, They've castrated me part. <laughs> I said they have. <laughs> yes, they've castrated me part. <laughs> I'll never forget John Barrymore. <laughs> they've castrated me part. <laughs> and what, is he, what else did he do one day? He was, he was doing something in that picture. Uh-oh. Oh yeah, that was it. They, they castrated me part. They they took took him off, took him off that part, cause they you, they you know they got tired of his saying the same thing, and he just forgot what he was supposed to say. But this was a picture where uh, maybe you young fellas know about it. John Barrymore, Lionel Barrymore, and Ethel Barrymore were in the same picture, 
at, at Warner Brothers. Boy, that was a big picture. They were in uh, one of the house in, in, in a European family, uh, one of the countries in Europe. But they, they were brothers and sisters, but uh, they were in this big picture. And I was working on the set and just kind of his man Friday with John Barrymore on that set and Lionel too. <coughs> Who, what was the name of that? But that's the only picture that I've ever known with all three of them on there. And, and uh, that's when he told me that they had castrated his part, <laughs> his part on there, Mr. Mr. Barrymore. Bless his heart. And I told him one time uh, about seeing him at the uh, Boston Opera House years ago, this back in the 20s. Before I even went to Tufts University, it was in 1923, uh, something like 24, and and uh, he was playing at a at the, was it Boston Opera House? Maybe it was Boston Opera House where Barrymore was playing, and uh, he was much younger then. I've been knowing him a long, long time, and uh, he was drunk. And he came to see he did parts, <laughs> half drunk, you know, and so forth. And so, and this picture, while, while he was doing this picture at uh, Warner Brothers, I said to him, Mr. Barrymore, I saw you in 1940 so and so, or something, 19, well, 19, yeah, no, no, 1930 so and so, in the 30s it was, at the Boston Opera House. He looked at me and says, do you remember that fiasco? <laughs> I said, yes, Mr. Barrymore. I remember. I said, didn't you forget your lines? He said, don't, don't say another word. <laughs> he was he was John Barrymore up and down. <laughs> don't say another word. <laughs> yes, he had forgot, forgotten his lines because he was drunk. And he used to come on the stage drunk. In those days, very, 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 very fine man, or and an actor. That family, you can't beat that family, man. Let's jump to your uh, re remembrances of, of Alamo and John Wayne and some of the stories there. You were a bit part in the Alamo. Yeah, I had a good part in the Alamo. What was my name in there? I don't remember. Uh, what was my name in the Alamo? But I was the only only black man in the Alamo. There was a little black boy, about 10 years old or something, 11. His, his folks were slaves, I think, in that picture. And, uh, uh, but he, he and I were the only two blacks in the, in the picture. And John Wayne was, uh, <coughs> his son, one of his sons had, had a bride, young bride. I don't know whether he's still married to her or not, but I, I think they are married. But they had just gotten married then in that time. Picture. What was that boy name? A heavy set boy of John's. In that picture. That was so long ago. Boy John Wayne. Can you tell us some of the stories that happened there while you were in Texas filming the Alamo? Well, yes. I uh one was showed just just how John felt about all people. I was involved in that one. Uh, it, it was a case of uh, uh, prejudice, I guess, uh, the southern, because this was way down in Texas, you know, on, uh, over on the Mexican side. But this was a restaurant over on the, on the American pole side, of the, the American side of it, that uh, uh, I was the only black man in, in the whole cast. And then these young white boys, college boys, this night invited me to go with them. They didn't have anything else to do, so they went to a theater over, over on the American side and wanted me to go over, and I went over there. And uh, they wouldn't let me in the theater nationally over in Texas, you see. And so uh, some of the boys raised cane about it. and. Uh, John, John, they told John Wayne about it, and uh, it, he, he didn't have any big fuss about it or anything, but he wasn't so satisfied uh, about the fact that I was humiliated, and they, they wouldn't let, they wouldn't let in it. So none of these other boys, white boys, went in the theater because uh, they said that I couldn't come in. And uh, so the next time, 
we went to an, a theater. John had fixed it up so so that it was all right for me to go in, you know, one of those kind of things, and uh, it didn't didn't cause any big ruckus like it was the first night. It was real embarrassing to know that for no other reason than than, than being black, because I uh, refused admittance over there. But these all these boys, these young boys, young Texas boys, decided that they were on my side. <laughs> I said, well. We're all Americans tonight, but I've been in a lot of lot of uh, places like that, a lot of places like that. Um, what about there was an incident about you going to uh, do some some uh, choral conducting while you were shooting the Alamo, and you had to get John Wayne's permission. Can you tell us that that incident? Oh, oh, uh, <laughs> let me see what was that. Now I was trying to think of that the other day. Uh, these were Catholic, uh, uh, see John was Catholic, and uh, this, these were Catholic sisters, and they tried to get him, they called him up, they, they wanted me to come over to, what's next, what, where were we working at, what, what town was that? I was in some place, but there was another big Tex Texas town, and uh, not far from where we were doing this Alamo, and anyway, <coughs> We were going to do, we were going over there. Yes, one of the teachers at the university, two, two universities, one was for young women and the other for young men, right there in the same town. This is the nearest town to where we were working. And the women, these sisters, called me up, up there on a the set where we were and wanted to know whether they could, whether I could come down and work with their girls with some spirituals of mine uh, 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 an evening or, an, uh, or a whole day. And then she said, we can get some boys from the uh, uh, college up there, and they'll come down so that we'll have a well-balanced choir with men and women. And uh, so I, uh, I, said, I told him, I said, you, you call Mr. Wayne up and ask Mr. Wayne's permission for me to get off to come because I I have only one day off and then he knows where I'm going and so far away I stay home anyhow. So they called him up and asked him if he could come down because he was Catholic too and this was a Catholic school. And uh, so they called him and asked him if he could come down. The next way, next day, I was sitting at, at, at breakfast where talking with a group of cowboys and he came and raised all kind of kids. You could hear him <laughs> two blocks away. Justin, what the goddamn hell are you doing? To asking my Catholics to uh, come down to, do, to, to work with my Catholic sisters in the school. And you, of all people, are Baptists. <laughs> I didn't say one word. Boy, he gave me a, a roll over there. And so loud, everybody in the, in the restaurant could hear him. Uh, the re whole restaurant was all our people on this show, and, but they all heard him giving me hell, you know, and so everybody was just as quiet, and there's nothing but Wayne talking, and he sat down beside me and talking, and he got so mad, he got up and walked away. <coughs> when we said, you keep your, <laughs> your nose out of my business, out of those Catholics' business. We don't want any Baptists around, you hear me? I didn't say one single word to him. So uh, about a week later, Oh, man sitting next to me said, when John Wayne left, this guy said, he was an older man, wasn't as old as I am, but he was older than by John's age. He says, Wayne's crazy about you, Jester. I said, he's crazy about me. And he said, yeah. He said, don't you know he wouldn't make that kind of fuss about it? I said, well, no. I said, that, that doesn't make sense to me. The way he cared and raised on all that cane, and he's crazy. So he's crazy about you, boy. <laughs> so... I, about four or five days later, I stayed out of his road from then on, and I was way over there by myself. I always did try to keep away from him, so I was trying to keep away from him. And he came over and sat down there beside me and took a stick and was writing down in, in something in, on the earth. He says, uh, you're going down to my real soft to me. He says, you're going down to the town the city of uh, wherever it was, uh, the nearest city. You're going down to the school, this girls' school, and work tomorrow morning on my private plane. You can leave at 
and uh, they'll stay all day long, and then you, they'll bring you, my man will bring you back at night. His private plane, and I went down there, I got up, and the flame was ready, and took me down there, and it had not only the girls, but they had already told the boys, they had it, and they had the whole, tr the two schools, two Catholic schools there, singing Negro spirituals all day long. <laughs> And I, I came back that evening and didn't tell a soul all the place about it. But Wayne was all right with me. Wayne was all right. Yeah, he was wonderful. And he's the guy that did it. Took the song. That's a great story. Do you remember anything else about the Alamo? Uh... No, let me see here. Uh, Let me see, does I tell you about, uh, no, I think that's about all I, I can think about now, about trips and things with the uh, shows, but I've had a lot of, lot of good friends that I've met in this business in, in Hollywood. <coughs> And Mr. Tjumpkin was one of the finest because I'm sure that I wouldn't be where I am today and I'm nowhere, but I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the uh, working that he's done with me. And everybody else, all these studios have been very, very nice. Very, very nice. Do you remember any other anecdotes or stories about working with other stars as, a, as an extra in other pictures? Does anything come to mind? Uh, let me see. <laughs> uh, what is it? I can, I wish. Oh, I, I don't know, uh, in this, in this concert that I've, done here this last week in up there I'm going to ne I'll never forget this concert because uh, up in Blues Creek North Carolina because uh, the the white people who took me up to the uh, town where my father my grandfather was, was also a boy up there uh, they are the ones who owned my parents in slavery you know and uh, they are the ones who invited me down there. They gave a concert in a little place called Lexington, North Carolina. That's where he's staying now. The man who has prop who owns the property that the 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 White Hairstons owned in the slavery days, and that's about oh I, I wouldn't guess over 15 miles of land, all all uh, under the Hairstons' uh, name, you know. And uh, the uh, estate is, looks just like a big one. Is, well, that's what it is, an, an estate. It goes, and he took me all the way up there, clear up to where I was born in this little town called, called Blues Creek. And then they were so nice when they found out that that's where I was born. These white people up there in Blues Creek took me all around to the little places, you know, to see if I could remember. I said, I, I was just born here. I don't remember a same thing. Thing, single thing, but uh, they 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 just gave me the whole city. It was wonderful, and the first time that a white and black choir, so far as I know, of, had taken part in anything, and they sang a whole concert of my songs, and that was that to me. That was all right. Uh, Chester, can you share some of how you got involved, and and. Uh, with these uh, situation comedy, Amen. Uh. Oh, uh, let me see. Uh, I was called by uh, Mr. Weinberger. Do you, do you know that name? You've told me before. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Weinberger is is the name of the uh, producer. Uh, he called me and uh, asked me what I was doing, and I told him, I didn't know that he was called me uh, referring to a job or something, but I told him I wasn't, do, wasn't doing anything at that particular time, waiting for another job to come somewhere. 
<coughs> so he called me. He told me that he would like to have me come over, or uh, and uh, talk to me about working for him. I didn't even know who he was, and so when I went over, I found out that two little girls uh, who worked in his office in in uh, Burbank. Uh, two, two of the little, were two of my sister, my daughter's very fine friends when she was seven years old, nine, nine, nine years old. She's 62 now, but she was nine years old then in those days. And uh, so uh, the, the, uh, the, these, he, he been talking, they were working, these girls were now working over in, in uh, what's that town next to? Where, where Warner Brothers Studio is, I forget. Burbank. Burbank, yeah, yeah. Working over in Burbank, and that's where his office was over in Burbank. And uh, so uh, <coughs> these girls worked for him, and they had they they had heard him talking about they wanted a, a, a comedian around my age, you know, had been in the business a long time, and so forth. And when they got through talking, they uh, got in touch with Mr. Weinberg and told him they knew just who they, who they wanted and they, they ought to give me a chance and call me first. And they did call me and didn't call anybody else. They called, called me and I stayed there with them five straight years. And then uh, this last Sunday, I uh, was called before Sunday, called on Thursday. He called me. Uh, we, now, we've been out over two years now, but he called me up and told me that he and his wife were giving a, a party at uh, one of the big hotels over there, and they wanted to know if I would come and uh, uh, be a part of the number of guests with, uh, that they were having, and that he was inviting uh, Marie Horsford, that's the girl that played the part of uh, the daughter. He, he invited her. And we were the only two from that cast that went. And I found out he did. He told me he would send for me if I came. And he did. He sent a car for me. And I went over. And uh, he, uh, he had a, uh, it was at this hotel. And he and his wife had rented a room in the hotel to stay there all day long while they were there. And uh, the downstairs, he had it all rented out for some Jewish. Uh, uh, party he was giving for something. And it was just packed with people. And that's the way he does all the time. <laughs> He'll write me or call me up, his wife or something, and tell me that uh, they're giving something and I go to anything, all, all kind of places with him. But Let's pause for a minute. Do you need a drink, Jester? Yeah, just to, I'll okay, take a little let's, let's take a few minutes, and I've got a list of questions oh, that sure. I want to ask you about because there's a lot of things.